We are live on KEXP, a listener-powered radio station broadcasting live from Duwamish Territory, a place you know is Seattle, Washington on 90.3 FM, all around the world on KEXP.org and the KEXP mobile apps. My name is Gabriel Teodros, and it's my joy and my pleasure to introduce to you Jeremy Dutcher. Down by the river she went 
Into the water she weighed Not by choice The rocks weighed down Just one story among the rest Drag the whole Red River Until she is found Into the fields he went Held by the air he left Oh, that shot from so close by Ten long minutes before he called and the old white jury said amen, amen. Collect all the poor souls they did. Drove past the lines they did. Starlight collecting in all their eyes. Oh, just stories among the rest. Into the river she waved. Propelled by the air he left And the land that held them As they died Take my hand and walk with me Together you and I Always remember her sweet love I will always be there for you We're here, here, here Oh. 
take my hand and try to see across rivers that you fear. Stories you're afraid to hear can keep our love away. I will always be there for you when you heal all this grief, when your tears find you again, when your heart asks who's there, dreams still whispering. Start to sing again. Take my hand and walk with me Together you and I Always remember sweetheart I will always be there for you Hey, uh, hey, hey Live on KEXP with Jeremy Dutcher. Can I give you one more? Please do. It's OK. Um, this next song is called Skijin Uyguk. It means Indian land. And uh, it just came out. I'm really happy to share it. Amazing. Thank you.
Thanks. Beautiful. Jeremy Dutcher, live on KXP. All right, yo, that was so beautiful. Thank you for bringing your music, your medicine to KEXP. How you feeling? I'm on top of the world right now. This is a dream come true. Yeah. You know, for a lot of young musicians, these, uh, these flashing lights uh, mean a lot to us. So yeah. it feels like a fruition of a dream to, to come here and share music and to have um, some, some beautiful uh, people here present to, to witness that felt really good. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm on top of it. I love it. So this is the first time I've hosted it in a studio where we had an audience that was actually in the room and it feels really special. So um, I was wondering if we could talk about actually like what brought you to Seattle? Because totally. I, know, I, know, I know we have like a collective basically of indigenous filmmakers, yeah, from, from around the world. That's it. Shouts to Tracy Rector, shouts to Jessica, shouts to Nia Taro. Nia Taro, that's it, you, you know? know? So, I got this yeah. invite. Um, well, it actually came through and I had some Nia Taro people approach me at the, the welcoming event and say, like, how'd you hear about us? How'd you get here? And it was actually uh, Yo-Yo Ma. Wow. I did a gig with him last year, and he said, hey, there's this organization. You got to you gotta check them out, Nia Taro. And yeah. I said, okay. So when I saw that email coming, I was like, all right, I'm there, you know? Yeah. And when we gather, we gather people like this, creatives, mm -hmm. you know, young indigenous creatives, um, it's a really magical space and time because we get to share notes, essentially, you know, like how it is out there, what it's like to tell our stories and create. So, um, you know, even though it felt like <laughs> when they sent me the invite, I said, it to, this is part of SIF uh, as well, the Seattle yeah. International Film Festival. And I said, they know I don't, I'm not a filmmaker, right? Like, yeah. you know, I'm just, the, I just play the piano and do some singing. And um, I said, yeah, 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 we know, we know. But it's about practice. We want to talk about practice, you know? And that kind of, uh, it, it crosses boundaries and borders between filmmakers or musicians or visual painters or, you know, it's like uh, we kind of all share that story of practice and trying to tell stories in a good way. Yeah. So I was just really happy to come and have this conversation. You know, uh, getting invited to KXP felt like just a cherry on top. Hey, you know, this I is great. I love it. I'm so I'm so happy it worked out. Um, I'm a big fan of your music. You know, um, had your vinyl, had your record on my shelves for, you know, and and in rotation for some years now. Um, I wanted to ask you about that mm. about your first album. Um, you told me how to pronounce it today. Wula Stuig Lindu Wagandawa. That's pretty good. The, with, with my elders, we always talk about flow. Okay. Because it's not, you know, um, there's a lot of uh, silent speakers yeah. and people that are just learning their language mm -hmm. that feel like, oh, that the F word, fluency, is like a real high bar, you know? Mm. So uh, we're taught always to talk about flow. Like, can you flow in your language? Mm. Mm -hmm. And um, we're, we'll work on the flow. We'll okay. work on the flow. Okay. But you got the you got the vowels right. The vowels, the Which flow. Is great. So I I might I might say my first album was called Wolisto Iglin Duagnoa. There we go. Yeah. yeah. And it's called The Songs of the People of the Beautiful River. So I've had this record on my shelves, like I said, for a while. I didn't understand what I was looking at when I looked at the cover of your record. Um you worked with wax cylinder recordings of songs from your people that were 100 years old. I'm guessing probably the first time you've heard many of these songs and you use these recordings um, on, this, on this album. Can you, can you talk about that process and even describe what, a, what, what is a wax cylinder recording? Because totally. I'm guessing a lot of people out there don't know what Fair I'm even enough. talking you about. Know, it's, a, it's a very old technology, mm -hmm. right? Like that's some of the very first early recorded music is on those wax cylinders. Yeah. And so it's a, it was a real look into the, the past or a bit of a snapshot of, mm -hmm. of how our ancestors lived, how they made music. It's quite different from how you know, certainly how I do it, but, yeah. but how many of our even traditional music makers make music now. So it was such a, it was such a insight into a past, but also a, a breathing past. 
like mm -hmm. one that felt alive to me because when you listen to those recordings it's not just the songs like they're they're telling stories they're contextualizing the songs they're laughing and dancing and you can hear all that mm -hmm. so it's like this beautiful snapshot and for me you know I was pointed to the to those recordings by an elder of mine named Maggie Paul and she said you know go there and bring those back for the people yeah and you know uh, barring actually going and physically stealing the, the copies of the wax cylinder. You know, there are these little kind of canisters, probably not much bigger than that, uh -huh. you know? Um, but hollowed out, and then it's wax on the outside, and the sound waves get etched into the wax. Okay. And then when we reverse it, we can turn it around and listen to that wax. Mm. So it's this, you know, sort of proto-record technology that just so happened to be ancestor songs. Yeah. And so when I got to go and sit down with that material, like you said, stuff I'd never heard before. Why was that? Mm. You know, that for me was kind of the whole problem. Right. And artists or creatives are all about solving problems in my mind. You know, we see what's unacceptable, what's what we see is, and we, we make solutions to fix it. You know, we offer something to the human family to say, what about this? Right. There's a, there's a great quote by um, an indigenous thought leader artist, musician, educator, Buffy St. Marie. Yes. Um, she says, if what you want is not on the menu, go into the kitchen, mm. cook it up, mm -hmm. show them how good it tastes. Mm -hmm. This for me is the, that, when I heard that, it like immediately oriented my artistic philosophy. Yeah. Because as much as it was a problem that these recordings were taken from the people and put in this institutional museum space and kind of unable to be accessed, what can I do about that? You know, what is my creative solution to that? So getting to actually do it with them, those yeah. ancestor voices from over 100 years ago, yeah. it felt like that was the best way to be able to do that, to infuse my own sense of music into those ancestral songs and try to find a, uh, something that spoke to this moment today, right? Yeah. Indigenous people were not stuck in the past, even though we often get portrayed in that way, but we lean on the past. Mm -hmm. We learn from the past. Mm -hmm. And we bring all of that energy forward to this moment to send it forward to those coming. That's right. So it's, um, for me, it was important to have those ancestral voices actually on the record, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to duet with them. Yeah. It becomes like a time travel in a way, you know, because we get to have that conversation um, in time through music. So oh. that's kind of, I, I always credit Maggie Paul, you know, mm -hmm. I, I speak her name in this space, she's my teacher, and she's the one that really pointed me to those recordings and said, hey, go and get them and bring them back. Yeah. And that, that the, the, my whole first record was all uh, 11 songs are based on, on archival research that I did. You know, it's a little, I guess, yeah, it's a little um, bit of a different way to make music, I guess, mm -hmm. um, but definitely my practice is super uh, grounded in research and yeah. in trying to, to pull all of that forward and show it to people, right? And to be a mirror, I guess I, I saw my goal as to be a mirror. So collecting all of that institutional knowledge that sits behind that archive mm -hmm. into this mirror and reflecting it yeah. to the people and saying, look how beautiful we are. Yeah. Isn't, that, isn't that stunning? Yeah. And, the thing, and then when I realized it's not just my little nation on the East Coast of Canada, you know, these museums hold all of our stuff, you know, from coast to coast to coast. Wow. So, you know, in, yes, I was talking about archives and language and love and community and family. I'm also talking about repatriation and rematriation of our objects That's right. back to our communities. Mm -hmm. So ho hoping to start lots of different conversations. With the new record, I'm also hoping to, you know, expand that, share music in English, hope maybe to connect with new audience yeah. uh, in that way as well. I'm so excited about the new music as well. So glad we got to hear some new music today. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, this this topic of language revitalization because I think it's 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 such important work, right? There's a there's a Garifuna a filmmaker who I met some years ago. He said that uh, language is the train tracks that a culture travels on, right? Mm -hmm. So so you're doing the work of like preserving and protecting and carrying a culture forward into the future. And there's a story I wanted to share with you, if that's okay. Um, here in Seattle, where we are, right, uh, Lushootseed, 
uh, which is the original language of the Duwamish and the Suquamish people, uh, was also an endangered language, right? And uh, there was elders who were a generation before us, right? Like elders like Vi Hubbard that did everything they could to document everything they could remember of this language. And it's because of the work that that generation did that you can actually see a written form of the Lushutsi language on monuments around the city. And a friend of mine, a musician who I hope you get to meet, her name's Kalina Lawrence. She's a, she's a Suquamish musician. She's the first generation who got to grow up going to Lashutsi classes on the Suquamish reservation. Because she grew up going to those classes, she now has the first Lashutsi language hip hop song ever made. It's called Lashutsi is Alive. We did this whole Sound and Vision episode about her work. And I'm, I'm telling you that story and, and it, because it connects to a story of yours and, and, and the work that you and your mother are doing uh, with the language class. I was hoping you could talk about that work. Yeah, I'm really happy to talk about, always happy to talk about that work. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. Absolutely. That, that story, that local narrative. You know, as a guest, I'm always like uh, a little, you know, I'm an indigenous person, but I'm just as much of a guest as, as anybody here. These are not my territories. These are not my languages. So to understand that there is that work here that's happening and that collectivity of coming together and, and creating space for generations. Like, it's so beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm like, ooh, kind of. Uh, and, and you know, as I get to go around, I'm very lucky to get to go and share music and, and then connect in with local communities everywhere I go. Um, and so often you hear this story of resilience right. and particularly around language. And I guess that's just where I'm looking to because it's, it's fundamentally my interest. And with my family, it's been such a, since I was a kid, it's like, uh, you know, my mother was very um, intent on letting us know that our language is severely endangered, and it's you. It's your, it's your generation's job to, to bring it, mm -hmm. to bring it back to health. Mm -hmm. And then I guess a lot of pressure for, for young people, but it did spark uh, a kind of curiosity or a kind of wondering about like, okay, there is a language, and it didn't get up and walk away, you know? Mm -hmm. It was... Uh, on the end of a strap, mm -hmm. you know? It was through religious indoctrination, through assimilation politics, that these languages, and it wasn't, it wasn't always just the kids in the school because there was, a, there was a sense of like, we believed it ourselves. Even some of the parents, like my mom's parents, didn't even speak the language around the kids anymore because they knew it wasn't safe. And so we're lifting all, of, we're, we're clearing all of that right now. It's this generation. And so for her to you know, be silenced as a child, mm -hmm. to have to go to those schools and be unallowed, um, she right now is taking that and making her healing our healing. Yeah. You know? So she is going and creating that institutional space, like a classroom space, where we can learn our realistic way language, the first of its kind, by the way. Yeah. We have not had an immersion, total immersion program. So, you know, we're kind of doing this from scratch. Like, we, we, we got a curriculum committee together. We're, like, doing the whole thing. Uh, it really takes a community effort, mm -hmm. you know? And um, it's just been, we're, we've been open for only one year now. And it's just started with one class of four-year-olds. I love it. You know? I love but we're going to grow with them, too. We're, we're going to keep growing yeah. with them. And as, you know, as they grow, we'll, we'll bring in new students. And uh, the school, if people want to know about it, is called Gakimin. And Gakimin in our language means teach me. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an ask to teach me Gakimin. But the important part, and I think is the essential part, the verb, a gak, mm. means to teach. It also means to learn. Ah, oh, that's beautiful. Yes. So it's encoded within our language yes. that there is this reciprocal mm -hmm. uh, relationship mm -hmm. between, you know, and and that we see these kids as as the future, as you're saying, as the as our 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 dream. Yeah. You know, we've been talking about this for a long time. We started our first year, and we already have kids that are playing in the language. Amazing. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. We already have kids that are um, asking questions in the language, mm -hmm. that are correcting the teachers. You know, it's like, this is, it's the highest dream. You yeah. know, it's, it's exactly what we could have hoped for. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's been amazing to see that, that come to fruition. Because it's a space that I didn't have as a, as a young learner. I had to go and just listen and learn, you know, and mm -hmm. kind of trial and error and get corrected a lot. And um, so anyway, it's a new day right now for our, our language on the East Coast, but it, as you're pointing to, it's like, 
it's everywhere right now. Yeah. Like these languages hold the key. Yeah. If I may be so bold. Absolutely. Um, to say like, we haven't been listening to the whole human family for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I'm hopeful that this is the moment where all of that's done. And we're seeing these, you know, these death throes of, of, of fascism or white supremacy in this country. And it's scary. Mm -hmm. It can be scary. But also realizing that that is ending. You yeah. know? And we're coming to a much better place where we can actually have real discussions about real history yeah. and shared responsibility and how we're going to take care of this place. Yeah. You know? There's the ecological threat that runs underneath that too. Because when we talk in our languages, you know, there's this thing around land acknowledgments. You know, when we get together, we do this land acknowledgement. Our language is a land acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. You know, when we use that language, it, it automatically imbues our world with life force. We're not going to cut down that tree. We're not going to, and if we do, we're going to offer something, you mm -hmm. know, because it's a, it's a being just like us. It's a relationship. It's a relationship. That's mm -hmm. it, what I'm saying. So, you know, uh, not to be too grandiose, but I really do believe that indigenous ways and indigenous ways of being and thinking are going to save the world. 100%. I agree. So, you know, and, and we're, the, the same logics which got us into the, the mess we find ourselves on the, you know, the, the verge of ecological collapse mm -hmm. is, is not the same logics that will find us out of it. That's right. So let's start getting creative about reimagining what those seats of power actually look like. You know, as a matriarchal people, it looks very different from what's going on right now. Like maybe we need to abolish these governments and just put some grandmas, you know, some matriarchs, just let them drive the bus for a while. Let's see what happens. That's right, that's right. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna get in trouble. You should go to the next question. I love it, nah, I love it so much, yo. That language re revitalization, like I said, yo, so, so, so important. I also love that like I read a whole book uh, by Bell Hooks called Teaching to Transgress mm -hmm. to understand what you broke down in one word, <laughs> to teach and to learn at the same time. You know, that's, that's really beautiful, you know? you know? And I actually had that experience, I should <laughs> say, like hanging around with these fellows too, I had that yeah. experience. That's what, what happens when people get together mm -hmm. from all different corners is I might say something in a way in one word, yeah. this literally happened to me yesterday where uh. somebody came in and I was blabbing on for 10 minutes and they said one sentence uh. and it was, it was the perfect, but that can only happen through these cross-linguistic bounds, through right. these cross-cultural cross bounds, you know, it's like uh, there's such generative space in the middle of us. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, man, this, is, this has been just such a joy and pleasure. I definitely could talk to you all day. Maybe we will talk off the mic some more. Um, but I just wanted to ask you, like, you've already answered this in so many ways, but it's always, this is, this is kind of like the final question I ask everybody. It's become a thing. What is, what is one thing you hope everyone gets from your music? Oh, I really, I, I want to honor that question. I want to think about it because it's beautiful. Um, Just the story, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, our stories aren't ours. Mm. Um, we gather them and we're given them. Like Maggie gifted me that story with the archive and set me on a path. Um, I hope that when somebody can come to my music, whether or not they have a literal understanding of the words, I hope they feel that story and can see themselves reflected in a story of resilience, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. just by singing that language that I'm not supposed to speak, I'm not supposed to know, you know, it is a sovereignty statement. It is a statement of, of our current acts of revitalization, like all that work that is happening um, so when people listen, I hope they feel that resilience, you know, they might not be able to stoke, they might not be indigenous, they might not be, um, but we all carry the story of resilience in a different form, you mm -hmm. know? And so I hope somebody can hear what I'm talking about with language, with community, with the power of music as a healer. I hope people see that and feel that, and they can also bring forward their own gift their own sense of wonderment, 
in this plane and their own vision for what, what like how we're going to fix it, you know? I think, yeah, there's a whole young generation now that is like, uh, that knows that we're in trouble. Because this is not a climate crisis, it's a human crisis. Mm -hmm. Like, the, the world will be fine. We are the ones that are in peril. And the young ones know this. And so they're on fire mm -hmm. with solutions mm -hmm. and with, with how we're going to turn it around. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's just about kind of giving the mic. Yeah. You know, being a bridge between communities, you know, um, being, uh, yeah, the between space I think is really important that I hope we can explore and that I hope people that listen can explore too, right? Because it's about identity. We, it, we sit so heavy in it sometimes and um, that allows us to make an enemy out of someone else or at least draw ourselves as different from them. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the truth, and when we go to like the, the elders, they say we're all brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. We are all kin. Mm -hmm. So yes, we honor the difference, but we don't draw the line. We don't build a wall. So um, I hope because indigenous people haven't been given the opportunity to tell their own stories on their own terms, I hope that now that we are doing that, that we are in that moment, it, it can't help but change things. It yeah. will shift things but it's going to be uncomfortable because they don't know us. Mm -hmm. You know, they, the big, you know, capital USA. They. They don't know us. Mm -hmm. They've been looking at reflections of themselves the whole time, you know, mm -hmm. getting Italians to play us in movies, you know, not even having us in writer's rooms when we're trying to tell mm. these stories, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like all that's done. Yeah. All that's done. Because yeah. look what we have in this room. Got we got our people telling our stories. That's right. And that for me is a celebration. So to answer your question, <laughs> I hope people feel a sense of celebration yeah. and resilience. That's it. Yo, Jeremy, thank you so much. A this, pleasure. This has been great. For KXP, my name is Gabriel Teodros. We are a listener-supported radio station here in Seattle, 90.3. Be sure to subscribe to see other videos and performances like this. Tap in kxp.org, our free mobile app to hear what we're doing all day long on the radio. And yeah, this has just been a pleasure. Thank you so much. And thank you to every storyteller in this room for doing what you do. Yeah, it's an honor. It's an honor to have everyone here, for real. Thank you. Discover new music at listenerpoweredkexp.org.